And every single ID block I give, almost, almost without exception, is using articane. So we need to get rid of that misconception as well. So not going down periodontal ligaments, let's get that one out the way straight away. There is no such thing. It's a complete misnomer. There is no such thing as a periodontal ligament injection. Get rid of that. So intraligamentary, as they call it. It doesn't right? exist. doesn't exist. Cool. It's complete uh-huh. misnomer. There's a lot of literature to back that statement. But what about that doesn't device, exist. Wayne? You know that, um, I forgot the name of <laughs> it. Uh, Injected press, what was it called? There's 12. There's 12 of those, <laughs> at least. Yeah, there's 12 of okay. them. There's LigmaJet, uh-huh. there's PeriPress, there's SigmaJet, there's, and so we can carry on. There are 12 at least of those. Quick Sleeper, however, is different. So Quick Sleeper wants to drill through the cortical bone, which is what I've just told you. We need mm. to get through the cortical plate. So to answer your original question, buccal infiltration is fantastic for single tooth procedures. There's been a huge trend in dentists doing less and less inferior alveolar nerve blocks. And to be fair, I've been part of this, right? I'm actually, I wouldn't say afraid. I'm not afraid of doing ID blocks. I just do them way less because I'm afraid of some of the potential complications that you see in papers and in opinion articles about the potential risk of paresthesia and other complications from ID blocks. And therefore, I've been a bit put off. So what I did many years ago is I started to do more and more articane infiltrations. Buckley and to be fair, like I told Wayne, Dr. Wayne Williams, the prosthodontist, who's a fantastic straight-talking guest. I love straight-talking guests, right? You're going to love him too. And, and I shared with him that, look, I only do about one ID block a month. A, because I'm getting so much success with my buckle articane, but B, because I'm being overly cautious. I'm really trying to prevent it because I think this scaremongering has worked on me. I am a little bit worried about the, the risk. You know, the more ID blocks you do, the more you increase your risk, or so I thought. Because there's so much we talk about in this episode in terms of the power of a buccal articane, but also knowing when to respect and knowing when that might not be serving your patient the best and why you should be perhaps doing some more ID blocks. And in fact, Wayne even says that he is a huge advocate of articane for ID blocks. So we're going to cover a lot of controversial topics. And and as you heard already, uh, Wayne is no stranger to controversy. And I love that so much. One thing I really respect about Wayne is that he helped to develop the CIA, the Crestal Intraosseous Approach. I had to really, it's a bit of a tongue twist, I had to really think about that. So the Crestal Intraosseous Approach. And no, it does not involve drilling into the bone. It does not involve buying a quick sleeper or something like that. It involves, actually, what he teaches us uh, is really cool about the anatomy and how there are these emissary canals in the bone. And we can actually utilize this to make our infiltrations with Artcane far more successful. And so because he started to develop and use this technique a lot, he actually would lecture many years ago and say that you don't need to do ID blocks anymore. So he went through that phase himself, but now he's gone a full 180 and he really believes in effective anesthesia through inferior alveolar nerve blocks. So I think you'll really gain a lot from this episode, which is covering so much of bread and butter dentistry. This episode is brought to you by Enlightened Smiles. This is the premium brand of teeth whitening, the guarantee a B1 shade, and it's just a slick system. The branding is on point, the pack Practicing on point, patients love it, very low sensitivity from my experiences. I did their online training some years ago with Payman Langrudi, and it's brilliant. It covers so many points related to consenting our patients properly for teeth whitening, from the white patches that can arise, from the expectations of results, for the treatment durations for different cases. For example, tetracycline staining, they have the whole protocol. So do check out their online training. The link for that is protrusive.co.uk forward slash enlighten, and that'll take you straight to the page to book onto their online online training. I want to thank Enlighten Smiles and Payman Nangrudi for supporting this podcast. The Protrusive Dental Pearl is related to a couple of videos I posted recently on YouTube and on the app. So this got gained a lot of traction. So one video is called Robin Hood Dentistry. And so what this is about is stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. And what I mean by that is if you have a lower molar, for example, that's completely beat up, right? It has exposed dentine, it has got cracks, and it needs restoring. It will really benefit from restoring, but there's no space because the upper plunger cusps sits right inside there. So what I talk about in this video, and I really encourage you to watch this video rather than just go by this pearl here, is the use of Robin Hood dentistry. Careful and well-considered enameloplasty of this pointy, sharp cusp to make it into a rounded cusp. It's much better stress distribution, and sometimes they remove a bit of height, but you don't want to flatten the cusp, right? You want to follow the the cuspal contours so that you can then have space to restore the lower molar. And you can apply the Robin Hood philosophy to anywhere in the mouth. And the reason I love it so much is because you show patients the photo and you say to them, you have a very aggressive opposing tooth. We have a very sharp corner of this opposing tooth, and we need to do some Robin Hood density. We steal from the rich and give to the poor. 
four. We're taking away from this arch and we're giving to the other arch. So communication wise, uh, patients really get it and it's good to tell them before you do it. Otherwise, it looks a bit sloppy. It doesn't look very professional if you're having to adjust the opposing arch after you've carried out some restorative dentistry, right? There is a, a second video that I've also added. It's called No More High Restorations, right? We place those beautiful composites on a rubber dam. We take the rubber dam off, the patient binds together and we're drilling away our beautiful anatomy. Well, if you want to watch the free version on YouTube, just read the show notes and click on or just type in YouTube, no more high restorations protrusive. You'll find my 20 minute video. And if you're on protrusive premium, there's a 30 minute plus video of showing the adjustments afterwards as well when there are some adjustments needed, how to keep them minimal and how to be efficient and very accurate in your conformative dentistry. Hope you enjoy this main episode with Dr. Wayne Williams and I'll catch you in the outro. Because some of the stuff will be controversial, 100%. I can tell you now it will be controversial. And I'm up I for love that it. as well. No, I'm totally up for that. Amazing. I love that. So, uh, you know, without further ado, let's actually okay. welcome you on. So I'm actually <laughs> might keep that bit in, actually. Dr. Wayne Williams, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. How are you, my friend? Yeah, very well. Thanks, Jazz. And uh, as I've said to you before, really delighted to be with you and part of the movement that you've started uh, and that's been going for so long now and uh, doing so well. So thank you again for the invitation. Great to be here. Well, thank you for your kindness and thank you for emailing me that day and tell me uh, about what you do. But also, uh, we were talking about skiing and how it, it could have worked out. You were in Morzine the week before we were for, for that uh, ski PD trip. So hopefully <laughs> next one, we'll, we'll make sure that uh, you're, you're an educator for that because uh, I, I looked at your CV. I was so impressed, Wayne. You, you have an amazing CV. So for those uh, listening, haven't heard of you, please let us know what is the day in, day out kind of work you do? Yeah. What are the things that drive you? I mean, you, from speaking to you before we hit record, you're so fascinating. You've got very, you're very multifaceted, but please Please tell us about what drives you. That's very kind. The profession's been great to me, Jazz. I've been very, very fortunate. Grew up in South Africa, had my undergrad and postgrad education at, at a universities, two different universities in South Africa. Left those shores towards the beginning of 2000, arrived, went straight into Harley Street, did two or three years in the city and a bit of Harley Street. Great experience and then decided the commuting wasn't for me. Thank you very much. And I've set myself up in the countryside in the Royal County of Berkshire and uh, have a lovely practice. We've been here for almost 20 years. My wife's a general dentist. I'm a specialist prosthodontist on the register here and very much still involved. I love what I do. I love doing all the prosthodontic components that we, we do, implants, big full rehab cases, um, lots and lots of specialist perio work in our surgery and just loving life. I was very fortunate in that uh, very early in my career. Um, in fact, while I was in my postgraduate program in, in South Africa, in my PROSO program, four-year full-time program, I was offered the opportunity to do some work in local anesthesia and became very involved at that point with a company called Milestone Incorporated in the United States. Uh, the manufacturers of the wand, which you'll hear a lot about in the next few minutes, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that took me around the world. And I was able to, with a team of other researchers and people around the globe, but mostly in the States, develop techniques and study anatomy and physiology and understand what local anesthetics all about. So that's taken me to, I think I'm at 31 countries now around the world that I've taught in, lectured, attended academic institutions and conferences. And so very fortunate, but glad to be in uh, Great Britain. Well, it's, it's obviously you have such vast knowledge and experience and also you're, you're, you're a specialist prosthodontist at the end of the day. It's, it's amazing. Like I said, multifaceted man. So I've got so many questions. I'm looking at them now. And then while you've been talking about the wand and stuff and I realized, gosh, I want to ask you about intraosseous and that kind of stuff. There's so oh, much yeah. we can go in. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, this could be a very wild ride. So thanks for introducing <laughs> yourself. Let's start with the first one, right? Let's start yeah. with the first one, which is how far can you go with buckle infiltrations with articane for lower molars? Is this the end of ID blocks. So your opinion, also what you practice and what you preach, because for me, yeah. I give about yeah. one ID block a month, if that, and I do, yeah. I treat a lot of lower molars. Yeah. What about yeah. you? Yeah. So really interesting one, Jazz. So in 2000, 2001, I introduced a big, big international meeting in Israel, a technique called the CIA. Wait for it, the crystal intraosseous approach. Mm -hmm. And I introduced that because we found a skull and it happened to be in Israel at the Hadassah University, that I only then realized what the bone in the maxilla and the mandible really, really looks like. And to answer your question, if you've got thick buccal plates, and we know that the buccal plates along the mandible are of our thickest bone in the body because it's our protective sort of zone, to try and get local anesthetic to infiltrate through dense cortical bone, not so easy. 
What a lot mm-hmm. of people don't fully appreciate either is, in my experience over these years, is we're dealing with a drug that's been given in the buccal sulcus into what's called a supraperiosteal environment. So the, mm-hmm. a buccal infiltration, the correct terminology, is a supraperiosteal infiltration, an SPI. SPI? Mm-hmm. And you're hoping that that drug will go through the bone. And the reason people are using articane for that purpose is it's 4% concentrated, meaning it's got double the dose. Not Because again, I ask people, what's the difference between 4% articane and 2% lidocaine? And people go, mm-hmm. 2%. Well, it's not. It's 100%. It's 100% mm-hmm, more. Mm-hmm. 4% is 100% more than 2%. And basically, we're using articane for a reason because we want that strong concentration. We hope, we kind of wish it to go through that buccal cortical plate. Not mm-hmm. so much, sadly to say. What actually happens is, what actually happens is, if you're dealing with a young patient and it's highly porous, it'll go through and you'll have a lot more success. And it's a great technique and it's one you should be using. It's one I use regularly. It depends mm-hmm. on what procedure you're doing. If you're dealing with a hot tooth, less successful. If yes. you're dealing with a small DO or MO restoration, highly successful. Sometimes those restorations you could have done without the anesthetic anyway. So it's kind of a placebo sometimes. Mm-hmm. We don't always realize it. What is guaranteed is the next time you get a chance, go online. If you come to one of my lectures, come to one of my presentations, you'll see slides of many, many skulls on the crest of the mandible is a massive open area with holes in it. And drop your anesthetic mm-hmm. in there, it goes straight down into the medullary part of the bone and gets to the nerves of the teeth. So rather than coming in buccally, I'm going in crystal intraosseous approach. So not going down periodontal ligaments, let's get that one out the way straight away. There is no such thing, it's a complete misnomer, there is no such thing as a periodontal ligament injection. Get rid of so that. So intraligamentary, as they call it. It doesn't right? exist, doesn't exist. Cool. It's complete uh-huh. misnomer. There's a lot of literature to back that statement. But what about that Doesn't device, exist. Wayne? You know that, um, I forgot the name of <laughs> it. Uh, Injective press, what was it called? There's 12. There's 12 of those, <laughs> at least. Yeah, there's 12 of okay. them. There's LigmaJet, uh-huh. there's PeriPress, there's SigmaJet, there's, and so we can carry on. There are 12 at least of those. Quick sleeper, however, is different. So quick sleeper wants to drill through the cortical bone, which is what I've just told you. We need mm. to get through the cortical plate. So to answer your original question, buccal infiltration is fantastic for single tooth procedures, not for multiple tooth procedures. So this type of intraosseous anesthetic works for limited times. In my experience and research, 30 minutes. So you go in, you go out, you're out. As soon as I start treating more than two or three teeth in an arch, I'm giving an Wait, IV you, block. Wait, you said intraosseous a second. Now, do you mean yep. sub superperiosteal? You mean? No. So I'm still going, I never, I hardly ever give in the buccal sulcus unless I'm doing a very minor procedure. I'll always uh-huh. put the needle intracrestal between the two teeth, distal to the one that I'm actually an- anesthetizing because the nerve mm-hmm. comes from the, from the posterior. So I use a technique called the CIA, crystal intraosseous approach, for all my single tooth anesthesia in the mandible, in the posterior mm-hmm. segments, and the anterior segments for that matter because the anterior segment is often more difficult to anesthetize because the cortical plate here is even thicker in some of these areas. So I think a lot of the time we do get success In fact, the majority of buccal infiltration, supraperiosteal, albeit, but with limited time frames to the success of that. And also, if you're dealing with hot teeth or teeth that require acute Mm -hmm. treatment, you're less likely to be successful. But also, I think one has to just be selective with which teeth you're treating. Anyone with a large master's, big square jaw, uh, I'm going to be going for the ID block. Uh, And also for, yeah, multiple Mm -hmm. restorations, uh, it has been my experience as well. And of course, the the hot pulp, uh, all those things you mentioned. But if you talk about the crestal injection technique that you said, I forgot the name of it already. CIA. CIA. Crystal crystal intraosseous approach. Fine. So uh, you're putting the needle in from the top and are you going into the attached gingiva or the uh, mucogingival junction or the alveolar lining? Imagine the papilla. Uh-huh. Into yes. the so-called coal area, C O L. Yes, yes, yes. If you go uh-huh. back to period, so you want to just see it blanch. It'll start to blanch buccal and lingual. The spread mm-hmm. of that anesthetic, if it's got a vas, and that's the other thing, you must use a vasoconstrictor yep. for all those techniques. If you're using a non-vasoconstrictor, very limited, five minutes duration on average. The problem with this technique is that because it's intraosseous, it's almost equivalent to intravenous or intraarterial. Mm i.e. it's going straight into our main bloodstream. The biggest blood vessel in the body is the medullary bone. And Mm -hmm. it goes straight in there. And because we have arteriovenous shunts in the head and neck area, it goes to the brain without getting infiltrated through our 
lungs, which is where a lot of the pH modification of local anesthetic takes place. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the reasons people get vasovagals. This is one of the reasons people get edgy about it. And you have to just be aware that patients can have palpitations when yes. you're delivering these drugs intraosseously. Whichever technique you're using, quick sleeper, CIA technique, tell the patient before the time, expect perhaps a couple of little alterations to the heartbeat, can get a little quicker, but it will ease usually within about 30 seconds. The key issue here is to lower the pressure at which you deliver that drug and the speed at which you deliver the drug. So Pizzoli's equation, pressure, time, and volume, the slower you give the injection, less volume over a longer period of time gives you lower pressure. Higher speed increased volume, increased pressure. So without using the wand, good luck. Seriously. Uh uh So just to put this in perspective, uh, and I need to get this out perhaps a little early on, I have no interest in the wand or milestone scientific, haven't for many, many years, although I was a clinical director early on in that company. I haven't touched a handheld syringe of any type since November 1998. Hi, my name is Mahmoud Ibrahim. And I'm Jazz Galati, and we wanted to make the best occlusion course in the universe. Now, we know that sounds like a big task and a huge ask. But we did I it. Think we did it. We did it. We finally made OBAB occlusion basics and beyond. And we've really, really worked our butts off to give you an occlusion course that is going to be applicable to real world dentistry. So, what's included in this pre launch deal? Well, we've got five different things for you. First of all, is the OBAB starter kit. We're going to send you a starter kit so you can start implementing the concepts we're going to teach you straight away on Monday morning. It's got a Huffman leaf gauge we imported from the US, and this is our favorite leaf gauge. It's also got a pack of shim stock in it, so you don't have to use your fat fingers every time. We're going to send you a pair of Miller forceps as well. The starter kit is worth £100, and we'll start shipping it once the course access begins on 7th of April. I think really anyone interested in occlusion, whether you are at the beginning of your career, in the middle, or even getting towards the end, Uh, would learn a huge amount from this particular program. The second benefit of this pre-launch deal is we're going to give you £500 off of the cost of the course. And you can take our word for it that we're never going to price it this low ever again. And this course truly has an unbelievable return on investment. The third benefit of the pre-launch deal is that instead of getting 12 months of access, we're going to extend that so you get two whole years of OBAB. And that's at no extra charge. And we're going to be adding lots of new cases and content as we go. I felt like I finally understood topics that I just struggled to wrap my head around for years. Um, And that's purely down to the way in which the content's delivered. The fourth benefit of this pre-launch deal is you'll get one fully mentored case with us included. That, I think, is, is massive. So we've set up a case forum and you can submit your cases for mentorship. So you get one fully mentored case at no additional cost worth £550. We're here to help and we want to help you through your cases and we want to hold your hand through some of these cases. And you have the opportunity to do that without feeling bad as part of a structured and organized way. And last but not least, it's the OBAB book. Now, this is going to be a fantastic companion to the online course. And it's got the world's first visual glossary of occlusion. This is going to blow your mind. It's going to explain occlusion to you like you're five years old. Fairly advanced five-year-old. Yeah, very, very intelligent five-year-old. But you get the point. We are so confident that you're going to get an amazing return on investment because understanding occlusion unlocks so much of restorative dentistry. And you'll start taking on bigger cases and you'll start having more fun in dentistry. Now, this pre-launch deal ends on the 21st of March. So what are you waiting for? If you are finally ready to say that occlusion doesn't confuse me anymore and you want to go from assessment, diagnosis and delivering high quality dentistry because that's what occlusion allows us to do, then let's take a giant leap towards predictable dentistry. It is the best course that I have ever done and I would recommend it to any dentist, whether you have a basic understanding of occlusion or even an advanced one you will still gain a lot from this course. Take advantage of this pre-launch deal ending on the 21st of March. Sign up at occlusion.online. Okay. And we do sinus lifts, full mouth perio, full mouth reconstructions, major implants, major grafting in our clinic. We only use the wand and have since November 1998. Wow. So there are no handheld syringes. No clinician in my surgery in our practice is allowed to use anything other than the wand. So we've looked at all the other devices, quick sleepers, peripresses, ligament jets, you name them all up. The safety device from Septodon, good product. At least that allows some form of safety in dealing with needles. But the old antiquated handheld syringe, as most people know it, 
1853 that device was invented, used <laughs> by Charles Pravaz, a French veterinary surgeon. Veterinary <laughs> surgeon. But everybody says they have a modern dental practice. I find that rather fascinating. <laughs> we use a computer to give our drugs. But Very the point good. going back to the CIA is any intraosseous technique you're using, you need to be controlling. And you'll know when you press on your syringe and you're in those areas, you have to press pretty hard. You're going to develop carpal tunnel syndrome at some point. You're going to have sore mm -hmm. fingers and sore wrists at the end of that day. But imagine the pressure. And myself and Mark Hochman in the States have been the only publishers we've measured all those pressures within the body for all these techniques. Wow, we generate some serious pressures and no wonder patients have post-operative pain when you're using these intraosseous techniques if you're subperiosteal. So in the mm -hmm. palate and in the buccal sulcus, if you do go subperiosteal in the buccal sulcus and you manage to get that blanching and the pushing away of the periosteum from the cortical mm -hmm. bone, that mm -hmm. builds up uh, a lot of pressure, Jazz, and um, creates some pain. Look, I, I agree with you, and it's something that I, I do do. I must admit, uh, and I might change my practice after speaking with you. But you know, I, I've seen the I've seen the downsides of this, uh, Wayne. I've seen two ladies who came back with bruising down their neck before. Okay, so I, I've, I don't know if you've seen that, probably because you no, know, you're, you're using the ones who probably have to pay me pre one no. days. But yeah. you know, I've, I've, yeah. thousands of patients, but it's still it's upsetting to me. So I did change my practice after that, really making sure that the, the pressure element is respected. But usually, what I do is uh, I do give it uh, in the supra periosteal, as you said, but then also into the attached gingiva and also mesial and, and distal in those right Fantastic. cases that benefit. Fantastic. So uh, yeah, is there any way that uh, you know so we can keep it safe? Drop the subperiosteal part because all that's doing is it is giving you soft tissue anesthesia. So for your cord packing or raising a flap or anything of that nature. But the other bit will be the bit getting to the nerve of the tooth. Always remember where the nerve enters the tooth. Mm -hmm. That's where you've got to get the needle. And so my whole start to all of this 20 plus 25 years ago was understanding flow dynamics in the human body. So I started studying what happens to that drop of liquid that comes out of the end of a needle, irrespective of what device you're using? I started by studying the flow dynamics of those liquids. And that gave me the key to everything else that I've ever developed and known since. And if you think about that, where every time you're giving an injection and you think about the direction that your needle is going in and where that liquid is going to end up. So what a lot of people, again, don't really think about with this technique we're just discussing is you're blowing that liquid out the end of that needle with your finger pressure and it's hitting that cortical plate, bouncing off it and going straight back into the soft tissue. Mm -hmm. It's not actually going through the cortical plate to where you want it to go, where the nerve is inside at the apex of the tooth. So the only way to get it to the apex of the tooth is to go through holes in the bone. And that's why the quick sleeper was a good development or the staby dent, which a lot of people know in this country. But people are drilling through cortical plates to get a needle tip through, good luck, to find that spot. However... If we look at the anatomy carefully, and we should all go back and look at anatomy if you want to think about good local anesthesia, then look at the crestal aspect of the mandible. There are holes waiting to be put through, and that's where we should be putting the needle. And how do you know when you're through? Because you want to be your depth of needle. Again, yeah. if you're using the wand, you're holding it like a pen, you have de manual dexterity and you have manual tactile re feedback. With the handheld syringe, we lose all of that jazz. That's mm -hmm. why I'm not a proponent of the handheld syringe. It's cheap and easy, but it's not the right way that we should be delivering local anesthesia. It's not possible for everybody to invest in more expensive technology. I get that. But the truth is, to answer your questions, it only comes from tactile perceptive ability to know when you're in these right places. And with the CIA technique in particular, I was only able to evolve and develop that technique through the tactile feedback. I know exactly, literally, the needle drops through. You can actually feel it. Mm -hmm. pulsate, pulpate and is, is, is this something that's possible with a 30 gauge needle or does it have to be the uh, something that, like the wand always 30 gauge well the, the okay. wand uses 30 gauge we use 30 okay. gauge half inch needles we only use two needles in in the wand. 30 gauge half inch 27 one and a quarter for blocks but i want to go back to two things if i may do you mind me jumping back please please You're, i'm things. loving this is golden the one, the one that you spoke about, the bruising. The bruising is really interesting. So when Hochman and I published and, and measured all these pressures in the human body, it, it's phenomenal for dental techniques. What was actually happening in your patient that had the bruising? You were rupturing venules and arterioles. You were actually rupturing those soft tissue vessels because mm -hmm. you had such high pressure at the end of that needle with 
with that fluid building up pressure and it causes rupture of those vessels. That yeah. bleeding then from those vessels goes into the soft tissue and gives you the bruising. And the only way you can avoid that is by reducing pressure and the only way you can reduce pressure is by giving slow delivery. So the one whole mechanism is a drop at a time. So a drop comes out. If you imagine this being the bone, the drop hits that bone, the drop gets absorbed. Before the next drop gets there, that drops already into the bone. Then the next drop arrives. So drop for drop, drip feed, almost like an infusion pump in a hospital, really. And the second point I wanted to make was why, if I may ask, because I think a lot of our, our, our colleagues will be asking this possibly, why would you choose to be doing buccal infiltrations? Are you somehow trying to avoid inferior alveolar blocks? And if so, I'd be very interested because I know the answers, I think. <laughs> I've heard them many times. Why are mm. you trying to avoid an inferior alveolar block? Brilliant. That I've takes us answer. into a whole new yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> let's, let's go. Let's go to let's the new go area. Let's go there. But, but, but just point on, on the point of sure. the bruising is really fascinating because sure. this is the first time it's happened to me, but it happened yeah. on two ladies the same yeah. week. It was yeah. It was strange. It really blew my mind. And I think maybe it's because I'm very slow. I'm usually very slow injecting. But I, I look back and I think, okay, here's what I do. I go very slow initially so they don't feel anything. Once they've got their yeah. soft tissue anesthesia, then I think I went too fast because, okay, they're numb now. So I knew, I learned from that that, okay, keep it slow even if they're numb already because it's, it's really good yeah. for them. So I, I, yeah. I think that's what happened. And then so why am I doing so many buckle infiltrations uh, is to avoid ID blocks. So why are we, the question is really why are we avoiding ID blocks? I'll be honest with you, I've read some of Tara Renton stuff and it scares the bejeebas out of me, right? So, <laughs> okay. Okay. so this, is, well, this is what it is. So, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, then you know, ID yeah. blocks can, may cause injury and uh, paresthesia, et cetera, et You'll cetera. have to give Tara my mobile number. She'll probably have it already. And, and great respect to Tara. She's done a lot of work in this field and, and I respect her work and, and I get it. But if I'm honest, I don't agree with almost Everything she writes about this, um, I don't agree with a lot of it. I probably only use non-ID block because of the type of work I do, vast, vast amounts of treatment and choosing not to use the CIA for a lot of cases. Probably 85% of the time I'm, I'm using an ID block still. There was a short mm -hmm. time when I, when I made the discoveries around the CIA that I went back and said, oh, I want to now, you know, discover this technique and now I'm going to use that a lot and put the ID block in. And in fact, in my lectures, many people in this country will have heard me say, oh, get rid of the ID block, blah, blah, blah. I'm totally, totally back on ID blocks and have been for the last okay. two decades, at least the last 15 years. So one, because I know they're safe and every single ID block I give, almost, almost without exception, is using Articane. So we need to get rid of that misconception. Uh, that was, yeah, that was one of the questions, as you saw. So let's, let's hit that on the head, okay? So we are, okay, but medical legally, will that be defensible? Is one of the qu questions I will ask you as well. Well, now we're into quite tricky territory, so I'm going to be careful on this one. But <laughs> in our clinic, for the last two decades, and this is, not a, this is anecdotal reporting. However, sure. it's also based on speaking to people in 31 other countries. Now let's, go, let, let's just go and start in Germany. Let's go and yes. start in Germany. 80,000 dentists... UK, 30,000 dentists, roughly. 80% of all injections given in Germany are given using Articane. All injections, all techniques. Only 20% yeah. are not, usually where they can't use adrenaline or choose not to use adrenaline. Got That's it. another subject. Their percentage, so you've got 80,000 people using 80% of the time Articane, 4% Articane. Why do, don't they report a single percentage remotely higher than we do for paresthesia in the mandible with an ID block. Exactly. And my hypothesis on that is because Articane's got nothing to do with it. What it has got to do with, and there, there are recently published papers on this, without proof, there is no clear proof. If there was, Jazz, hang on one second. If we knew for a fact, if Tara and her companies and people that she works with, if they knew that this was seriously dangerous, do you think we'd still be allowed to give ID blocks with Articane? Yeah, we wouldn't, I'm, no. I don't mm -hmm. think we would. So I don't think there's sufficient evidence to say that is. However, there is sufficient evidence for people to be scared of that, but it's because they don't understand what the problems are with paresthesia. For one minute, think about what the primary cause of paresthesia is. Traumatic it's be trauma. injury trauma to the, from the needle, right? A long needle. The, not the agent, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry also to point out that predominantly the voice of anti-articane, anti-ID block use comes from maxillofacial oral surgeon departments, of which Tara may or may not be part of, I'm not sure. But the truth is, are they not perhaps looking for alternative 
reasons for the cause of that trauma mm -hmm. or the reason for the cause of the paresthesia and how can we ever prove whether a needle has hit that nerve or not and how can we ever prove whether it is with lidocaine, articaine, mepivacaine, anything else what actually causes that and that's part of the problem here. So I'm not suggesting for a minute that people should just at a whim start using articaine for, for all their ID blocks. They need to check this for themselves. In my clinic after a long, long time, I'm 58 years old I've, and I work every single day, four and a half days a week now, but predominantly six days a week for a long time, doing lots and lots and lots of ID blocks, only using articaine. And, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you many stories of, of maxillofacial oral surgeon, one in particular who worked with me and alongside me for a long period of time. And when he first joined us, he was part of the group who went, I'm not touching Articane near an ID block. And within mm -hmm. a few months, he only uses Articane. And two <laughs> decades later, he's still using Articane for all his ID blocks. And the reason we use Articane is because it's so much more effective because it's double the concentration of lignocaine. So the single most difficult injection to get a predictable outcome for, you're telling me we want to be using the lowest concentration drug. I say no. The least predictable of all the techniques, we, use, we need to use the highest concentration of drug in a safe environment. And you have to be able to aspirate because that's now the next domain we go into is, oh yes, but I have this reaction and people are that. And again, we're going into blood vessels, but we're not aspirating. And if you're aspirating with a handheld syringe, you're getting false negative aspirations if you're doing it, because most people tell me they're not. Mm -hmm. If we treat to ourselves, every single case we do with a wand, irrespective of where we inject, automatic aspiration. Automatic aspiration, which means we can keep the needle still and it doesn't go back and forth in and out of the blood vessel. So we're getting true aspiration results. Does it mean we'll never have a problem? Of course it doesn't but it reduces that risk tremendously. But to answer the point regarding articane and ID blocks, I'm yet to be convinced, and I want to see clear research data before I'll stop using articane for ID blocks. That has been really eye-opening. I think that's good to hear, refreshing. So thank you for sharing that uh, with the producer, Ranti. With hitting bone, I asked this on another episode as well, one of my strategies when I do give an ID block, which I feel in my head is keeping safe, is I actually, I was taught to hit bone at dental school, but then I, I heard from this surgeon called Radislau, a Polish guy, he says, don't hit bone because that deforms the tip of the needle and that's what could be causing the trauma. And so therefore I stop hitting bone. What should I do? Okay. So, Jazz, one of the advantages of working with a microscope and using high magnification, as you'll probably know as well, is honestly, on a lot of my injections, I, I examine the needle straight after infiltration or for ID blocks. And I'm yet to be convinced or see bending. And I do touch bone. I think hitting bone is probably a strong term. Forcing <laughs> needles into bone is, a, is, is quite strong. But the reason I had to study this at the time and still do look at it carefully is because I use the crestal intraosseous approach so much, there's a, there's a distinct chance that my little 30-gauge, half-inch long needle can hit a, a harder piece of the bone and deform, even break, dare I say. I've never seen one. I've read them in the literature and, and legal cases. But the, the truth is there is a potential for deformation. I take that point. But I think you have to hit it. Remember, these are medically grade devices that are being constructed. If they were that weak and were, were, were curling around every time we touch something, I'm not sure they'd be released into the human body. But I'm not advocating that we press things hard against bone. I'm certainly not advocating hitting things. But mm -hmm. again, if you, and it, maybe again, the wand comes to fore because we just have that much more tactile sensation to be able to feel when we're hitting things or touching things because we're holding it like a pen. And all other devices are held as if we're holding, I don't know, a boxing glove or something. I don't know what it is, but you guys do this stuff. <laughs> but the truth is, again, I'm, I'm yet to see that. But I do share your, your concern. If, if that needle does curl up, and I've seen pictures of those, um, mm -hmm. it'll rip all the tissue as it comes back out as well. Yes. And the drug won't go to where you want it to go. But are you going to ask at some point? Sorry, was there anything more on that point? Because I was about to ask you, do you know what the failure rate of an ID block is? Across the world. Oh, wow. This, this is a really interesting one, Wayne. Okay, yeah. so my, my, my immediate guess 
would be 50%. But this okay. is an educated guess because when I was in okay. Vietnam in my, as a fourth year dentist student, I was with a very experienced dentist. He was in his 60s at that stage. Uh, and so uh, the protocol, uh, we were in this uh, Vietnamese rural, rural area with these orphans. We were giving them dental care. Uh, and the protocol was that the, we give the kids two ID blocks because he said, we know that half of all ID blocks fail. So let's give these kids two ID blocks. Okay, how kind were we? And then we'll do their treatment. So that's where that number is stuck in. Okay. But I'm sure you have a more okay. researched okay. answer. There's a slightly more researched answer. So again, <laughs> um, a, a, a publication, because I, I, li I like to go back to publications wherever I possibly can. And in some of these areas, there aren't. The Articane one is a difficult one. But the failure rate has to be, has to be a very high potential for 25%. And the reason it's 25%, at least, and that's a least figure, I think you're probably right, it's probably closer to 50%, possibly, there's no publication on that number, but in a paper by Hochman and others in the States some years ago, they took x-rays by putting ID block in particular needles, so length 27 gauge, one and a quarter inch needles, through bits of meat, and then they x-rayed what was happening to those needles, bearing in mind that dental needles are beveled only on one side, mm. whereas medical needles sometimes are beveled on both sides. So when you have an arrow, sorry, um, correction to myself, medical and dental needles are beveled on one side, but when you have an arrow, it has two sharp points like this. So when it goes through soft tissue, it goes through straight by cutting through on both sides, whereas our needle is only beveled on one side. And orthodontists in the audience will know if you push a beveled instrument of that nature through soft tissue, it will always deviate to the side towards the bevel. Mm -hmm. So they studied this. And what that means is that when you're holding a handheld syringe and you're aiming for the lingula, because you always have to be above or at least in line with the lingula to get anesthesia for the inferior alveolar nerve. If you're using a straight instrument and that arrow is going straight, the needle's going straight, but then curves down, as you're doing it, and there's lots of x-rays that we were then able to show with this curved needle, and it dips below the lingula, that's a failed anesthetic. Mm -hmm. So when a people aim low or when the needle curves low, so even if you're aiming Gal Gates style really high, which is what I advocate, go really high, go too high rather than too low, but then aspirate because you're getting close to the pterygoid venous plexus, lots of things to be scared of. So you go up high, but if your needle then bends, you're still going to fail because 25% of the time it can either go up 25%, down, left, or right. It can go four wow. ways, that needle, depending on where your bevel is. So with the wand, what we then discovered was if you rotate that needle back and forth, you change the position of the bevel, and it goes dead straight every time, exactly like an arrow. So you, you're creating bevel there, bevel there, bevel there, by rotating just 180 degrees. And that's the reason I can honestly, hand on heart, tell you, I cannot remember when last I gave a second ID block or when I had a complete failed ID block decades ago, literally decades ago. Amazing. And, and, and so the, the question I have now, I mean, to, to visualize the needle bending in, in that way is fascinating, I think. Take a, take a, piece, of, uh, take a piece of meat, mm -hmm. put it through, and then take some x-rays. Don't, I don't know how you're going to get yeah. around the x-ray radiation part of that, but yeah, yeah, and yeah. stand outside the room and all the rest. I will read up uh, Mark, Mark Hochman, H-O-C-H-M-A-N, publication, probably early 2000s, Mark Hochman, bevel translation in, in needles. Which is, which is why sometimes uh, I, I see my patient's notes and there's a note saying, uh, difficult to numb, aim higher. <laughs> because it, it could be that. Now, my next question is, you, you mentioned about the technique with a wand in terms of rotating. Would that work with a handheld traditional anesthetic? You can't do that, right? I've, I've mm. challenged people to do that because there's always somebody in, in an audience somewhere, and that's global, by the way. They go, oh, oh, Wayne, I don't hurt patients. You know, I do thousands of injections. I don't need the wand. I, I don't hurt people. All my patients tell me they love me. I'm painless. I'm the best in the world. Yeah. And they also tell me I don't have failed ID blocks and etc. Et and I say, well, that's great. You know, you tell me how you do it because I can learn something. But what, what, what then you always get someone also that I don't need the wand because I can do that with my handheld syringe. And I say, well, show me. And it's just physically give it a try for yourself. If you can, yeah, let yeah. me know because I'd love to learn that technique and, you know, put myself wrong. But um, honestly, it's, it's physically impossible with a, with a and, and whether that's a safety injection or whether it's a handheld syringe, whichever, especially the mm -hmm. 1853 Charles Prevers one, that, that's impossible. Brilliant. Uh, next question, I guess, in, in, in the theme of anesthesia failing uh, is I was at a lecture by uh, my friend uh, Lincoln Harris uh, and he mentioned oh, yeah. interesting things uh, about 
Redheads, which I knew already. Um, yeah. red, you know, yeah. People with redheads, they're yeah. the more difficult to numb. But yeah. also uh, large heads, because large yeah. heads have large yeah. bones. So yeah. should we fear the large-headed redhead? Uh, is, is, it, is that a tr- <laughs> true or false? Is that a myth or is that, is that real? Uh, and any strategies to help the large-headed redhead if it's true? Well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. And because you made it to the end, if you're a Protrusive Premium, answer a few questions based on this very engaging, very real-world episode. And you can gain some CPD. How good is that? So if you're not already on the app, head to protrusive.app on your browser, sign up and get CPD and watch exclusive content. We, of course, left you on a cliffhanger. So there is a part two coming where we finally find out, is it a myth or is it real that red-headed, large-headed people are more difficult to numb? And also find out which are the three types of anesthetic that Dr. Williams keeps in his practice. Okay, so I'll give you a clue, actually. Out of mepivacaine, i.e. scandinest, lidocaine, and cytonest, we already know he uses articaine, okay? Out of those three, okay, so cytonest, lidocaine, and mepivacaine, one of them he thinks is absolutely useless as we and we shouldn't be using it. So you'll find out which one that is next time as well. And if you're listening to this and it happens to be before the 21st of March, then this is your final chance to get access to OBAB for two whole years and get a fully mentored case worth £550. Thereafter, you'll have to pay for mentored case support, right? So in the discussions, yeah, we'll support you all day, all night. But if you want us to spend time to go through fully your case and give you structured feedback, then we will do that. But that's a paid feature. If you want one fully mentored case, then that is available if you enroll before the 21st of March. So hope to see you there and we'll catch you in part two of this episode.